Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum, that's A-K-S-U-M. You can join the YouTube channel directly or find the Substack and so many other things. Today, our special guest is Chris Butler. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about uh, talk about Irvit. <laughs> Me too. Um, I. And I want to get into Urbit and what it is. And don't worry for folks, this is not going to be the super technical deep dive. This is going to be just two people who are using it and one person who's doing research and will, you know, speak to whatever we can in as many layman terms as we can. But before we uh, get into that, I'm, I'm actually interested in kind of your um, overall background as well. Yeah. I think that always helps the, the listeners. So you've described yourself or been described. I don't know if you came up with the bio or someone else did as a, a chaotic good product manager. And I've played a lot of RPG games I've talked <laughs> about before. And I've seen the like charts from yeah. chaotic good, chaotic neutral, chaotic evil. Can, can you talk to us? You just outed me as a and d player, basically. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. No, no. I, I So I, I, I've definitely... Um, Ever since I've like ever remembered, I've I've always like loved this idea of like role play and Dungeons and Dragons, but also early on like Cyberpunk and Shadowrun and all these other things that kind of like just mix this idea of I, I've always loved the idea of trying to figure out how I would plan something. And so it probably started as like a lemonade stand when I was like six or seven years old. Like, what does that mean? And then turning that into role play um when it and like Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know why, but this idea of like Numbers for a long time were really the thing I focused on. I would say now what I tend to focus on is more words. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, that idea of kind of how do you how do you role play or figure out some type of puzzle through this way of Dungeons and Dragons or or role playing games, I think has always been really interesting. Um, but that's yeah, that's probably like the reason why I, I I love the idea of chaotic good because I think a lot of what I end up doing in my practice of like product management ends up being a lot about decision making. But I found that a lot of people bring things like bias or assumption or something like that to it. Um, and this idea of throwing a little bit of chaos into what we do when we try to make good decisions, I think is really helpful. And, and the reason why is it gets us out of these things that, that we are biased about in some way. And it could just be that like we have an opinion that might be wrong. And then, by the way, we're always wrong. And somehow we just don't know how yet. Um, and so that idea of like chaotic good, I try to, I, I did give myself this moniker um, but it's mostly just because I want to make sure it's clear that like we need to add a little bit of randomness to what we think about. And ideally, I'm doing this for good, which is like to help people make better decisions, make the right decisions for themselves, things like that. Um, I, so. I saw that language about randomness. I'm wondering, yeah. are you also a, a reader of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which is where I've certainly seen talk of uncertainty and things like that and probability and risk from? That's right. So he's he's much more like... And, and, and by the way, like he he's also like one of those people on Twitter that like when you try to follow him, he's constantly picking fights with everybody for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, from his books, like especially around uncertainty and this idea of how do you understand whether something is actually a good decision or not? He talks a lot about that idea of of like people being too certain in an uncertain situation. Right. And so that's definitely it's not just him, but I, I would say like. Where this comes from is even the idea of like, uh, are you familiar with John Boyd? Who um, mm -hmm. he basically is, uh, he was a, a jet fighter pilot during the Korean War, and they um, he also then ended up going into uh, basically military strategy. He was part of the U.S. Marine Corps for a time, um, and he came up with something called the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act, which is. It, it's shown as like a single loop, but if you ever want to like open up the full thing that he's written down, it's like this crazy multi-diagram thing. There's like, there's actually even like a, like a star <laughs> with like a bunch of stuff in the Orient step, which is all about like your preconceived notions about the world. But he is really kind of, I think, credited for this idea around maneuver warfare within the U.S. Marine Corps that gets at this idea that <clears throat> the idea of attrition warfare was something that didn't make sense anymore because it was about like being fully understood or legible between both adversaries. And that's not the way you want to fight if you want to win, <laughs> or, or at least you don't want to have like huge losses, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's where he went into a lot of like work and studying 
not only things like Sun Tzu, right, all the way back to the art of war, but but this idea of even things like guerrilla warfare and uh, German like um, kind of blitzkrieg and those types of things. And this idea of like, how do you do warfare better is what his whole thing was. Um, but the step that's really most important in this OODA loop is really the orient step, which is how do you understand based on some information you observe based on that information, based on all your background, and they include things like cultural, like all these other things that are inside your head that are there helping you make decisions. You now have to decide, do you update your orientation? And then how does that change the way you do decision um, decision making and then acting on that? And so that orient is the part where you can really go wrong <laughs> because if your adversary is, for example, playing with your ability to observe, they make you observe something that isn't real. They make you observe something that you shouldn't, right? Or you don't, or, or like something like that, it can cause them to make really bad decisions. And so there's an oversimplification of this OODA loop to be to mean basically like you're making decisions factor, faster than your adversary. But the reality is it's actually, how are you subverting them in some way? And what I would say is that the, the human mind tries to subvert itself constantly. <laughs> like we're always overthinking things, we're underthinking things, like all the biases that we talk about that are in that cognitive bias, like, chart of 150 things, they're all impacting us, right? And so the question becomes like, how do we get out of this a little bit? And that's where I think that randomness ends up coming in is that um, we need to sometimes just use the universe as randomness to, because the universe doesn't care. Like when you draw a card, <clears throat> it doesn't care if you're disappointed whether that card was drawn, right? Um, what does matter though, is what do you do with that information afterwards? And so there's a huge thing that's, that's very interesting to me about randomness, which is, <clears throat> it's not just the, the like randomness of like the static in, in a TV that is pure randomness, right? But it's how do we take some type of randomness that then human beings can interpret and turn into something meaningful? And that's the thing is we're basically like meaning machines. And so um, I have like a bunch of like decks of cards that I keep around or like I'll yeah, use right. dice or like things like that, where what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get at this idea of like, how do I do a better job of interpreting with the current situation so I can make a better decision? Um, and so that's how I kind of like use randomness. Um, but yeah, I mean, Taleb is very interesting. Again, getting back to your main question, like his, his, the, the thing of like, you're too certain in this moment, I would say John Boyd also talks about that a lot. And then there's a, there's another person, uh, Kenneth Stanley, who wrote this book, like why greatness cannot be planned. And he talks about this idea of like, whenever there's been a really great, amazing thing that's been discovered, it's been very rare that we knew that that was going to happen ahead of time. Right. So like the idea of the vacuum tube to the computer. Right. Like when people invented vacuum tubes, it was for a very different purpose than what turned into transistors, which turned into personal computers, which turned into like our ability to carry around a supercomputer in our pocket. Right. But what we need to do is we actually need to use novelty as a way for us to search the space rather than being overly confined in the way that we deal with things. And so. I don't know. That, that's that's something that I, I, those are kind of some like foundational people that I think get me at this point of like how I think about the world and why randomness I think is interesting. Um, but I, I feel like I just went on a huge like uh, tangent. on no, it's, 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 it's beautiful. And I, I see the, the beauty there between the, the word order is not in there. It's a good instead, but I think the good might be a stand in for that because it's an, it's an ordered chaos. Like you're saying, yeah. uh, well, let's talk about it as like order to me, if we use the physics definition of it is dead, right? Like, like mm -hmm. these, these atoms over here are ordered, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's, that's dead. Uh, if we talk about like chaos or entropy, right, is, is like the, the heat death of the universe because everything just becomes like lukewarm and it's all just randomness, right? But there's like this, this edge in between that, which is really in the world of like complexity theory, right? Is this idea of like, it's something that we can't quite predict but it has something that's more intelligent than, than randomness and it's not dead like order. And so like the Santa Fe Institute is this group out in Santa Fe, oddly enough, um, but they think a lot about like complexity theory and um, they're kind of like a think tank around this. And they do a lot of really interesting research about how do you co connect these like complexity theories to like behavioral economics or um, the way that diseases spread or, or these types of things that, that like, you know, if you look at, Kind of traditional econ economic theory it ends up being very theory centric that is like it's a comp computation that has a bunch of parameters that you just like turn the crank whereas the reality is like humans are complex we have goals and like we talk to people and we like change our goals and there's all these things that make just the world in general a very complex place and so i guess i'm just not i'm not willing to believe that things are simple and ordered and i'm not willing to believe that we are going to let things like the heat death of the universe happen and so in between is like humanity <laughs> basically is the way i guess i start to think about it
Yeah, it sounds like you see the opportunity. And when I'm thinking about it, I'd never read the texts of John Boyd himself. But um, well, by the way, he hasn't really. He has one paper that he wrote. Everything else okay. is basically slide decks from the '60s and '70s. So okay. Okay. I, I went and visited his archives um, at Quantico, which is where the U.S. Marine Corps archives are. And so I visited his archives twice, wow. um, just because I'm I'm a fan. So I you yeah. know. Um, so I went and visited, but yeah, like, it's really crazy The the biggest book is actually by this person named Osinga, which is like the blue book of Boyd. And that's like a very in-depth look at kind of his inspirations, what he gets all that from, but he really didn't write very much, right? He was more of like a spoken word person and he was talking yeah. to like generals. He was trying to create this movement inside the Marine Corps where it was very attrition warfare focused to be more maneuverist is what they would refer to it as. Um, back I, I read Jeff <clears throat> Sutherland's book when I was looking into scrum a little bit. <clears throat> And he mentions Boyd. He also mentions General MacArthur, along with like the whole yeah. Japanese idea of Kaizen and yeah. the Toyota chief engineer. And these all seem like very similar and connected movements. Does that mean as a as a product manager on the kind of and it might be, you know, stop me if it's a caricature mm -hmm. of the of the role, but are you on the more iterative side and agile side than the waterfall side? Yeah. I mean Waterfall, when I graduated college, wasn't a bad word, by the way. <laughs> like, that was what we learned in college to figure out how to do software projects. Um, I would call it gated development now because that's really what it is. I think there is this over focus on like agile versus waterfall when the reality is what we're talking about is kind of certain types of differences in time frames and then certain beliefs about the certainty of the world, right? And so, waterfall or gated development is very certain that if we just think hard enough, we can get the right thing. And that's where I think I diverge, where I'm like, I don't think you can ever think hard enough without like actually going off. Like, like the idea of, you know, no, no plan survives contact with the enemy, <laughs> right? Like, like you have to go out and try things. And so I, I guess I would say I'm more iterative, but I think there's something interesting about lean that is a bit of a mismatch, right? Where lean, and I, I do a lot of kind of not, a, not only like coaching, but like train, like basically education. And, and so I'm also a, an associate professor at Art Center College of Design doing like oh, yeah. design. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with um, kind of leaders that are trying to understand how to build software better. And a lot of the time, the lean methodology makes sense because we're trying to remove waste from people's jobs, right? But I think there's a little bit of a mismatch in the sense that this idea of Kaizen and even the idea of like lean and the Toyota production system is really about how do we make this system that is kind of like, it, it has a single job, it creates cars, right? Materials go in, people work on it, cars come out. Mm -hmm. That manufacturing line doesn't exist anymore. At least we do not work on the manufacturing line anymore. Like if yeah. you want to talk about what computing is, the manufacturing line is a web server somewhere. <laughs> That's the manufacturing line. What we're doing though, is we're constantly reimagining that manufacturing line by like deploying new software to that server. And so I think that's where it's not just about efficiency, right? Because yeah, we should remove waste from the way that we do things. And it's not just from the standpoint of like, is that web server being as efficient as possible? But also when, you know, as I do my job, how do I remove waste from what I do, right? How, but I, I don't like the word effectiveness, uh, sorry, efficiency anymore, because it gets too much of this, like, this over-reliance on like story points and velocity and all these things that are really about output. When the bigger problem is like, are we building the right thing? And that to me is more about effectiveness, right? Like, am I actually doing the most meaningful job I could right now. And I mean that both in like a very meta way, but also like in a very direct way, which is, are we building the right thing? Am I building it the way that makes sense for me? <clears throat> and then also like a, when I say meaning, I mean like fulfillment, right? And yeah. am I doing something that is valuable to me in some way that allows me, you know, I think you have to get into this whole realm of like, we're part of a continuum rather than the idea of just me working on something. And so I was going to ask you, is it, is it personal meaning or is it, part of the feedback loop between leadership and the customers? I would argue that in a good organization, there's no difference, right? Because like we all have individualized experience, right? And so, you know, I, I don't know how much you want to get into like the idea of suffering and all this other stuff that we can start to get into. But like, I think there's something that's really individualized about this idea of that it matters how I experience this world, right? For me, at least. And that when we talk about working together well, like it requires us to do things that haven't been done before, right? Like a lot of the stuff that's already been done is like, it's not easy, but like you can understand how to do it. The question becomes, how do we solve these bigger problems that we have? And that requires us to do something that humanity so far has not been able to do. 
right? And and so that's why I think like we need to maybe this is like one of the skills of a great product manager, right? Or or capabilities of a product manager is this idea of being able to reframe what part of the system we're thinking and talking about at that moment. Because like <clears throat> part of me will talk about like the meaning of this person. That's zooming into this person, like how do they work with their team? How do they think about the work they do? Do they have the right skills? Do they have the right capability? Do they have the right power within that role to, to make the decisions they need to? But then you can like reframe it and say like, actually, is this team working well together, right? Do they have the right type of goals? Do they have the, the right way that management is giving them goals and giving them agency and autonomy, right? Um, and so I just think that's, that's like a very important aspect of whenever we're trying to do problem solving is that idea of like, what view are we talking about and should we reframe it at this moment or not? Right. So yeah, that, that's good. And I know that you're a writer in addition to a speaker and a, pro a professor and a product manager. So in, in your writing, I know you've tackled this idea of communal computing and yeah. it sounds related to what we're talking about right yeah. now. What was it that you saw in it? Well, let's say, can you tell just briefly in case people don't know yeah. Internet of Things. I've heard the phrase since about 2013, <laughs> but there might be people here new. I used to be a headhunter in the, yeah. the technology field, okay. so uh, I didn't even know what it meant back then. And we just, <laughs> <laughs> we're just if it's on the resume, you know, you bring it up and you, you sound you, know, you sound like you know what you're talking about. But can you tell people what the Internet yeah. of Things is and the sure. sort of the problems and and yeah. what you saw as a way forward? Definitely, I, the way I kind of define Internet of Things is that you know, as computing, compute and connectivity, right, becomes more and more commodified. It means that everything in the world could potentially have sensors, computing power, and some way to report back something. And so, you know, right now we mostly think about the idea of computers or phones as being that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but even like the idea of a hue light bulb, right, that's sitting in your home or something like that, it has compute in it, right? It's making decisions. Um, Maybe not decision. Again, I don't want to get into like how much we anthropomorphize all these things. Um, but like this idea that it actually has some type of processing power. It has things that it actuates like turning on and off a light. And it also has sensors potentially like light meters, heat meters, potentially like a bunch of stuff that they may put in these light bulbs. And then it has a connectivity usually through Wi-Fi or some other type of radio signal. And there's a bunch of different standards that are out there around this, um, like Zigbee, um, this idea of like matter and thread as a protocol for like mesh networks within the home. It's a bunch of terminology. But what it basically means is that like everything in your home eventually could be smart in the sense that it can have this type of compute and sensing and, and connectivity. And so, you know, what started to happen, right, is that at first the really the only compute that we had in the household was basically the, 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 sh the shared home computer desktop, right? That sat in the living room and everybody used it probably. Um, it was a shared computer. TVs and even radios, I guess, and even phones, right? There's like transistors and those things at a certain point. Um, but I like use the landline uh, phone that was like in the kitchen, right? With the really yeah. long cord as like the beginning point to talk about the idea of communal computing, which is that um, that is a device that has a sensor, right? It has a microphone, um, it has a speaker, it has something to do with like calculation or it's related to a client server architecture because there's actually the routing happens at like a phone grid or a phone switch somewhere. Um, but then it allows you to connect with other people. But what it didn't have is a sense of identity in the way that we think about identity on the internet today. And so what it meant is that when someone called that phone number, right, which was like just a series of digits, um, or was like a word and then some digits at first, right? Because you had to go through like a switchboard, but then turned into like a set of numbers. Whoever, you didn't know who was going to pick up exactly if it was a household, right? It could have been like the parents, it could have been the kids, it could have been a babysitter, it could have been anybody that was there. But we were okay with that, right? Like, like it was fine that this com communal device, and there was even things like, you know, yes, people, once it started getting cheap enough, people started having their individual phone lines. But there was that issue of like, are you talking, having a sensitive conversation with someone and someone else in the house like picks up the phone or something? Yeah. Like um, but or the AOL internet. Well, yeah. And, or you're like on a bulletin board somewhere and suddenly someone, you know, like picks up the phone. And I, I used to run like boards way back in the day, um, you know, from like 2400 to 9600 baud modems and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, the, the fact that this was not like, it had a multi-use and it was appropriate for everybody in the household to use, mm -hmm. for the moment, right? And so when we fast forward, like this idea of the shared computer went away, right? We started all having individual devices, not only as laptops, but as like phones, 
right? <clears throat> and then Amazon comes out with the Echo. And the Echo is essentially this like, basically a general computing device that's voice actuated in some way, mm -hmm. that now sits in the home. But then all these problems start to happen because of the way that the identity model still tries to be that there's one person logged in, which actually, you know, if we want to go back backwards in time again, this comes from like client server architecture back in the R&D days of like mainframe computers, where when people started sharing computing, you had to know who was using up this resource so that you could like start to time slice them and say that you have this computer from like the server from like 10 to 12 p.m. or something like that, right? And um, basically you had to be logged in. And so then all of this ends up being put into the computing world that individuals have. And so mm -hmm. you then have like, I have to now be logged in or someone is like set up this computer with their accounts, basically. This carries over to Amazon Echo where, you know, you have your Amazon account attached to yeah. it. Um, and it starts to get really odd because then like if I add say Spotify or I like add all these other things to it, right? Netflix has had to deal with this. Amazon has to deal with this. That, you know, like my kids, when they play music on the Google Home Hub in the kitchen, it impacts because it's tracked as behavior to Spotify, it impacts the recommendations I get on my Spotify account. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I start getting like Minecraft music, which is a thing somehow, <laughs> like it was like a, a playlist made for you, right? Yeah. Um, and same thing with like Netflix, like Netflix saw this early on and that's why they not only did like cue, exactly. different cues for DVDs, but also like the profiles that you see when mm -hmm. you watch Netflix somewhere, right? But the, they don't have, which I think is really interesting, is they don't have like, they don't have like, hey, the whole family's watching. Right? Yeah. They have like, it's the kids or it's the one of the parents or the other parent or whoever, whatever adults have set up profiles there. It's and like all, individualized. <laughs> that's right. It's all very individualized. It's about the idea of like me, that I'm the only one that when I select my profile, I'm the only one in that room watching. And so it should be all the recommendations I have, right? Um, and same thing with music, same thing with like even Amazon shopping, right? Like you can kind of group people into prime accounts, but it gets weird. Like if I'm the person who buys everything for the household, yeah. I'm actually getting recommendations for the household rather than just for me, right? So like that one time I bought like these like pads to put on the floor for a dog, basically, mm -hmm. right? We don't have a dog anymore. <laughs> Our dog passed away a couple of years ago. I right, still get right, recommendations right. like, hey, you have a dog, you should buy all this stuff, right? <laughs> and so it just gets like weird. And it's not adapting to the fact that, at least my hypothesis here is that what we should really be doing is we should be thinking about compute platforms or compute endpoints, right? So like the Google Home Hub in my kitchen, we should think about it as like, that's part of the kitchen, right? And and that's like, whatever music is played on there, that's kitchen music, yeah. <laughs> right? And when we start to talk about like, even things like, you know, hour of the day or day of week or like who's in the room, there's a bunch of things you can start to gather as far as context, but before that, it's the kitchen. It's the same thing like the fridge, right? Like the fridge doesn't ask you to log in before <laughs> you like add food or remove food or something like that. And anybody can open it up. Even guests can open it up, right? Like mm -hmm. so there's very few things that are actually inside the household where we lock them up. Like there's maybe your, like if you have a safe and there's your front door, right? And But even then there's like, now there's social norms that start to dictate whether someone can just like barge into a closed door yeah. right? or whether you need to knock first or like, is it appropriate to disturb dad because he has a phone call right now or not, right? Like, <clears throat> those are all things that, that are end up like in a social norm space rather than this idea of like authentication and identification. Even so that the, that the, the younger people, um, I'm, I'm getting up there now and the younger people, I would FaceTime people. And I know some people say, how dare you FaceTime without an appointment? <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's, it's so weird because like, you, you know, it's almost like, Try scheduling phone calls versus Zoom versus not like all these things that and that's maybe this is a great point that it's not just about this household. Right. Mm -hmm. But like when I was working at Facebook Reality Labs on the portal device, it was actually about how do we connect like this household with my kids to grandma who lives in a state somewhere far away. Right. And how do we allow for that those rooms to almost be adjoined at that point? Yeah. Right. What's there's things like social presence about how much you're kind of letting go of the disbelief that they're not there. <clears throat> How are you making it so that it feels natural to have a conversation and actually just to hang out? Because I think that was something that I noticed before I got something like the portal was that it basically felt like I was giving a status update to my mom about the kids, right? And the reality was though, what we do now is we kind of just like turn on the thing on the, I use the TV portal because I think that's, I'm very bullish about the big screens with like video cameras attached to it for like video calling. And um, like I just like this morning, 
you know, the kids woke up early. My sister's based out of Scotland right now. And so she basically just hung out with them for 30 minutes while I went and like took a shower and did some other stuff. And so she was like babysitting, but she was like halfway across the world, right? And that's amazing because that is a connection they wouldn't have been able to have. And just hanging out wasn't something that we would have done if we were doing a phone call. That's right. So there's something really interesting about that idea of like, how does, and, and then, you know, getting back into this realm of like com communal computing is, you know, for a lot of these devices, you end up having all your contacts listed in that device, but that's not appropriate because I don't want my kids like calling any random person I know on like Facebook, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So then the question is like, what's appropriate in some way for the kids to call or for my mother-in-law who basically lives here to call or my wife or any of these other people to call, like what is the right set of people that just anybody should be able to call from this device? And again, that gets back to the idea of that telephone landline where it's like, anybody should be able to pick up this phone and then maybe there's speed dials, right? But it's like, who are the appropriate speed dials? Like I wouldn't put my bank's speed dial there. No. I would put maybe my mom's speed dial just in case anybody wants to get in contact with her. So I think that's the thing that we're really missing here. And, and, and that's why I think I was like, I, like maybe talking about Urbit and, and the, the grant that we received that I received for this was, was really like homes are going to get more and more technology in them as time goes on. And there's a lot of problems that come with that technology. Like, um, like if you move and you have to reinstall it, right. If you, um, if you constantly like, they're updating the terms of use or they're, you're, you have to like, you forget your password or people want to turn on the light and they don't have the app. Like there's all these things that are happening where there's a mismatch for the use based on what is actually being developed. And so that's, I think a really important thing for me. And then the second thing is like, when we start talking about the idea of identity and especially Urbit, right? Like the idea of Urbit as your computing, right? I think is really, really exciting because it almost makes me wonder, would you want to install Urbit on your body or in your home, <laughs> um, right? Like, I, I mean, this is the thing is the trend right. of computing is going two directions. It's either going up to your face and that's like VR and, mm -hmm. you know, Neuralink and whatever else, horrible, yeah. whatever other thing comes in that, you know, we'll have bugs. So I would just say, don't be an early adopter for that. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> but then the idea of like, everything will be moved out to the environment, right? So, so like the idea of having like even in like Fahrenheit 451, right? Like they have like full screen, like video calling, right? Because that was immersive. And that honestly, I think we're, we're going not exactly that direction, but this idea, and I, I don't like using dystopias as like the end future goal. Like I think a lot of people are making that mistake with the metaverse right now um, and that terminology, but like people want to be able to be connected with other people. And a way to do that is to make it feel like they're in the same room as you, right? And so, I think those are the two directions that technology is going. The personal one is like, like dealing with my work, dealing with personal mm -hmm. matters with people that are not overlapping with the identity circles that I'm currently within. So like, you know, it's, it's like the issue that Facebook keeps dealing with, with like um, memories, right? So there's been a lot of cases where they've shown a memory to someone of a couple of years ago and it was like a dead child mm -hmm. or it was someone they broke up with or something like that. And so, that's hard to do like in a way that is very public. And, and especially with like, if I have a bunch of like drunk photos of me from college, suddenly showing up on all the picture frames in my household, that's like a weird violation of the identity that should have been there, right? The ide mm -hmm. identity separation in some way. So I think urban is really interesting because <clears throat> it puts identity at the core of the computing, which I think is, is kind of just like saying what we've been doing for a long time, which is that yes, I, computing is identity. <clears throat> right. It's can we pause for a sec, and can you just say in your own words, not again, not having to yeah. be in any technical sense, in how you how you understand it, what Urbit is, and yeah. what was it? I think you're on that that train of thought already. But what was yeah. it? Draw yeah, yeah. I, I guess the way I think about Urbit is that it's it's basically a reimagining of the way that current operating systems work, so that not only do you create your own networks, right, and at the corner of that is and like the central to that is your identity within this network. But it's also about how do we, I think, rethink this relationship with third parties and client server architectures where it's no longer about offloading things to somewhere else. It's about how does your compute stay with you? And I think there have been a lot of other people that are in the community to think about it a lot of different ways, but it could be <clears throat> not only can I put it in like a small computer I can carry around with me, right? Like there's people that are putting on Raspberry Pis and they're using that as their compute and they'll just show up and then do that. Um, or like, is it that it's like part of my laptop and it's my social network and it's these things, but like, I don't have to worry about someone else moderating or deciding what is happening with that network, right? 
Um, now, a lot of Urbit still depends on infrastructure that's on the internet, right? So you still have like, yeah, part of the star's work is like matching IP addresses to routing <laughs> in the world and stuff like that, right? Like, so there's still this dependency on like network layer things, but it's trying to say that at this application layer, we're deciding a new way of like how this compute works. And um, I think that's exciting. Again, I always like these projects that are kind of like trying to push past what we've done as far as paradigms for the old way of thinking, right? Um, the part that I think is really interesting, though, when we, we talk about identity is that, you know, inside of the Urbit model, there is one identity, right? And, uh, you know, I've talked to a bunch of different people, um, including yourself about this, <laughs> about like, what does it mean <clears throat> to have one identity? And would you feel good about that? And, and honestly, like the, the early results are that people are split. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that... Um, I know this is like a hypothesis. So I'm still pulling all this together in my reporting, but like, you know, I think there are some people that do think much more about unification of all the different ways that they do things. And they're they're probably more individualistic too, right? So, so mm -hmm. there's this idea of like in the United States, especially, and again, I'm, I'm American, so I can maybe talk shit about the way we talk about, we do things, but <laughs> we're very individualistic, right? Rather than inter, interrealistic when it comes to the way that we think about our relationships, right? So it's me as an individual and then yeah, I have a family, I have work, I have all these other things, but we see this air gap between me and these other things that I do. What I think the reality is, is that, is that there's actually these overlapping circles between me and these other things. So like me and my family is actually a relationship of some type that then what that does is it, it basically says that, well, if I didn't have a family, if I didn't have people that were members of my family, there would be no family identity for me. Right. So so I do honestly believe that there's relationships are the core of identities. And I think a lot of like people that are in the self-sovereign identity world and all of this stuff about the future of identity, they do agree with that, that it's usually about act they, they would frame it a little bit differently. They would frame that usually it's about this identity that has attributes attached to it. And that could be membership to a group. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is like, I think most identity is about this relationship, but it's about a lot of relationships. And so I think there are some people that are more OK with having one identity across lots of relationships, right? They're they're more kind of like, I, I like unified in the way that they talk about things, who they are, that type of stuff. But there are other people that have very different lives depending on whether they're at home, whether they're at work. Yeah. Um, and so anyways, I think there is something interesting that it seems like people that are further along this path of like settling and having kids, it feels like they actually seem to care more about having multiple identities and or better privacy um, versus people that are earlier where they're more kind of like unified in their identity. Again, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not like, we're not doing like mass research here, but based on the people, we're starting to see this like interesting segmentation of like, and, and the people that end up being more kind of unified in their identity also tend to care less about kind of third parties having access to data. Um, and so there's some interesting things there. And, and I think that's where like, it's really exciting for Urbit, right? Because Orbit has these models when it comes to identities, like not just the idea of like, say, you know, maybe not everybody will be a star owner within the Orbit network, right? As like a hub, but having a planet, having moons, and then even comets as this like throwaway identity, right? Um, ends up allowing for this type of relationship building that allows for multiple identities, but it's up to you, right? I think that's the thing that's, that's most important here is you decide what you feel comfortable with. And I think there's a bunch of work we need to do in like, how do people make those decisions is really hard because like the way that like Facebook tries to help you with that decision is like, Oh, for this pool, for this post, who should be able to see it? And it's like, you have like five different versions plus custom plus your profile security, privacy settings and everything like that. And it's like, well, who did I actually share this with? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So it's not like more ACLs. I don't think it's like more access control lists or like permission settings. I think there's something different we need to do. And that's, Part of what this like, just to be at very high level about this like grant is like one, user research and understanding how urban users actually think about smart homes, identity, data privacy, things like that. Um, doing some workshopping to understand kind of how urban could fit into this like life cycle of the IoT device, right? Like you have to buy it, set it up, maintain it over time and then eventually sunset it. And so how does urban fit in that? Like, is it just working with that device or is it that device or what? Um, and then same thing for identity life cycles. Like as you create new identities, a new identity today is you sign up for a new web service and they give you a new, you sign up with your email and password, right? Third parties also start to like now link, like if you use Google or Facebook to log into something, you start to link all these identities. But then you may end up using something like 
in the parlance of like urban, you use like a comet to join a community. Mm -hmm. You're doing it in like an experimental way. And I think the way that people think about this today is like gamer tags, right? So people that have gamer tags, <clears throat> they tend to not choose their own name usually, right? Yeah. And they build a personification that is in there. And I, I think this is where you end up getting privacy violation, right? It's like, I want to control the flow of information. That is something that's pretty clear across everybody. I want to be able to control the flow of information. But what's where you get this privacy violation is like, like if I'm like a member of the PTA and I'm talking about like something about the PTA, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't want my like poker scores for my online poker plan to suddenly <laughs> show up. Right? Um, or, or like other things, right? Like even other things where I want even more private mm -hmm. identities, right? Like I don't want that showing up in that context because, and it comes down to reputation technically. Yeah. Right? Because when you bleed reputation between identities, that's when weirdness happens. Now there's benefits to it. And this is where, I think Urbit has to figure out a lot when it comes to reputation and identity, because if I'm, you know, when we talk about things that are on the chain in some way that are like actually immutable, right? Which things do I want to be immutable and which things do I want to be ephemeral? And how do we allow for the fact that like, if I'm a very important person in this one community, how do we, do I vouch for myself in this other community? Do other people vouch for me? Like, what is that reputation thing that ends up happening as you move between, between communities? Right now, the, the planet name kind of does that for you, right? Especially for people that are seeing you in other contexts. But I think it's a really hard question, especially when we talk about like all the other types of legible identities that are out there, which include your state driver's license, your IRS tax ID, like all these different things that you end up creating as like identities in some way. Um, so I don't know, I'll, I'll stop there. But that, I think that's why it's like such an interesting and tricky problem is that at least with Urbit, we have the opportunity to kind of rethink these things that we've been doing for such a long time that cause a lot of weirdness and distrust in the systems that we've built, right? Yeah, it's fascinating that you that you talk about how all these people want to be compartmentalized. I have found in my life that I have compartmentalized, I think in greater degree than a lot of other people have. At the same time, mm -hmm. I'm probably in the unification camp that you described yeah. and, and prefer it because I think the big thing that Urbit is trying to do is to combat the lack of accountability for being a bot that when the more ephemeral an identity is, yep. the more likely you're able to do behavior that's not going to be kept accountable. So it, it's a trade-off like you, yeah. like you said of a, of a balance of you wanting to separate poker scores or whatever else that you want to keep separate yeah. from more professional and even familial settings versus wanting to keep out bad actors. Yes. And it yeah, seems and I, like it's heavy on the keeping out bad actors side right now. Well, yeah. And I, I mean, pseudo anon like pseudo anonymous identities are meant to be a safe way for you to also express yourself, right? Because there are repercussions in social circles for things, right? Like, and, and again, it depends on the social circle, right? Like what the repercussions are. And it's based on norms of that culture or social circle or group or community. Like <clears throat> communities are all about borders. And the reason why I say that is because in a community, there's what's in and what's out. And if there's no such thing as that, there's no such thing as a community, right? It's just like everyone. And so you always have to draw this line about what is acceptable versus not within a community. Now, the idea of pseudo anonymity that's really interesting about this is like, you know, even like Poole from 4chan has talked a lot. He has a TED talk about how he believes Anon is actually a way to do safe experimentation for creative endeavors. Now, it also probably creates a lot of like horrible things in the world, <laughs> but there's also yeah. like, a lot of good things that have like, I mean, maybe I guess it depends on if you think like the meme pipeline is like a valuable thing to have or not, but it probably has given a lot of people joy as far as memes, right? Like, so so I don't know. That, that's, the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, <laughs> the idea of like a non being like a force to be reckoned with as far as computer security is another like interesting output of this, right? Um, so, so that's all I'm saying is like I think you're right. It's this explicit trade off about throwaway identities allow people to experiment more, to be more potentially be creative in a safe way, but it means there's not repercussions for doing things that are bad behaviors, or at least what is considered to be a bad behavior by that social group. And so spamming, great example of that, right? Like, like if you could get an email that was exactly when you wanted it, that was the thing that you needed at that moment, and it was like super serendipitous, that would be amazing. But the problem is, is that like everybody <laughs> that's trying to sell everything thinks that they're that email. And so there's no repercussions for sending email today. And that's why like 
yeah, when I've talked to everybody, it's like no one's had a time where they've been spammed <laughs> in, in Urbit because of that fact that there is so much identity attached to it. Now, I think it's also because it's self-selecting of people right now. Like there's a lot of people that are self-selecting in this. Yeah. I think strong Very communities true. will help avoid that. But I think what we're going to get to is though is like, again, there are going to be some communities that I want to join in an experimental way. And what does that mean to join a community in an experimental way, right? Because some of the time I'll have to join and then I'll have to like put in the work to gain reputation there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard decision because like some of these things you want to be unified, but other things you want to try out first. And I, I actually, I'm writing a piece right now um, around identity and it's focused on the metaverse just because of that's like a hot term right now, but it is yeah. trying to talk about like, what does it mean when we have things that are more online that are integrated with our real lives? And it gets to be a really tricky thing is like, what is the right life cycle for an identity? And is there something where I may want to experiment with an identity, but then dox myself to another reputation once I feel safe enough to do that? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I don't know what the right term is. I was going to say like a mask or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I understood um, what you meant. Yeah. But, but that's what I'm wondering about, right? About these identities because, um, yeah, I mean, we are communal people. We want to be around other people. We want to interact with other people. And we want to find people that we can interact with that are, it's not just easy, but it, it can be challenging, but it ends up being, I think, meaning, meaningful again, right? And the way we do that is by experimenting. And, and there's there's another great post that I think I actually need to look up and, and kind of like pull out some of this identity stuff, but it was about the idea of like, um, like punk scenes, right? That originally are like very small and very focused on like punk. And then there's all these like hanger-ons that come around and then there's all the sellouts that like just kind of adopt. And so there, there is this like natural transition between how these types of communities end up eating themselves in some way, right? I think that's just natural. Um, and so, but I, I guess maybe like looking at it from a complexity standpoint is that like, that is true. If you're not, if you're not changing all the time, you're probably dying. Like, and there's no such thing as a runaway, like constant growth because eventually you use up all your resources. And same thing with like, if you're not like constantly changing or dying or, and I believe a lot in like the idea of like creative destruction as a term. Um, yeah. Like if you're not doing that, I don't think that you're actually, is what? From Joseph Schumpeter. Well, yeah, so he, I, so basically John Boyd adapted that term as well. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah, it's from him. <laughs> but like, yeah, so so I think there's something about like, how do we, and that's something I do in my practice as product management too, is a lot of the time it's like, you know, because um, I do a lot of stuff around what's referred to as product operations, which is how do I make someone as effective as possible or mm -hmm. the community as good as possible? So I'm, I'm almost like a community steward, right, for this group of people that are working together. And... Um, some of that job is like, well, hey, this we have this process here. No one seems to like this process. <laughs> Why are we doing this process again? And and then we'll say like, well, there's these three goals that we have for this process. And I can then look at that and say, well, why don't we experiment with just doing this for this process and then holding off on these two other things, right? And so this idea of like breaking apart things and rethinking about it, like the idea of bundling and unbundling is all you do, yeah. right? And, and so I think that's another thing that we need to think about is like, not only life cycles of like identities, but also life cycles as communities. And, and I think it's a natural thing. I just, I think we, we try to think about it that like this community will be here forever, right? Like this is every generation is like, we will be cool for forever. And then the next generation is like, you know, they weren't that cool, but now we're cool. <laughs> and so like, there's, there's this like continuous thing. And I, I think like it, we, it would do us all better if we just understand that there are life cycles and that there are kind of, there's evolution and there's death and there's all these things. And we just need to like, if we do a better job of maybe honestly planning for it, but like being okay with it and, and, and understanding when to embrace it and when to fight against it. I think that's, that's the hard part is knowing that. Um, but I've seen, that's what I, I think is interesting about like Urbit has probably only gone through like, I mean, they've been around for a long time. Yeah. I wonder how many death and life cycles of communities they've gone through, right. As, as a whole. And I, unfortunately, there's no way for us to find this out because it's all private, right? Maybe yeah. self-reported. But I think there's something really interesting about that is like, I think you start learning a lot about the way that this type of uh, happens. And, and again, look at it as like an identity for me as an individual joining communities, not joining communities. And then also like as the collective, how the community ends up like moving and changing over time as well and potentially dying. Yeah, structurally, I could think are a bit of at least three, and those could probably be split 
into more beginning phase. It was absolutely just Curtis Yarvin. Then, you know, he, yeah. he brings on Golan and, and yeah. several yeah. other people. Um, and then, you know, there's a point, I think sometime in 2019 where he leaves and mm-hmm. it seems like the biggest growth has been since he's left and it's just going to continue to grow till, um, like you said, there's so many people who are totally uninterested in the early, mm-hmm. what could be perceived of the politics of it, but just want it for their own personal purposes. And especially since it's an open source project now, I think yeah. that that structurally changes it a lot. Yeah. And I, I think like that's that's the exciting part about this is like I, I think the part that like attracts me to this project as well is the idea of like a long term or long view perspective. Right. Like um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Long Now Foundation or anything like that, but yeah. um, it's basically a group that thinks about like what would we do if we were considering a 10,000 view future um, uh, t- 10,000 years in the future, right? And so they actually sign all of their dates with like zero to <laughs> zero to two, <laughs> basically, um, to to show that like there's like we're talking about like 10,000 years of history rather than just like 2,000 years of history or whatever, right? Like, <clears throat> so I think this idea of the long view is is really valuable because it helps us make different decisions in some way, right? Um, I think a lot of the stuff that that people have been making decisions around with, especially with like devices. One of the things that did come up in the research again, like that I thought was interesting is the concepts around that IOT kind of feels and like smart home stuff kind of feels like throwaway stuff, right? It it almost feels like very, like some of it's cheap. We also don't know if those places, those things are going to stick around for a long time. And because they don't necessarily like keep things open, it means that once a company goes away, like what am I supposed to do? (laughs) And so um, I think this is something that I, I think one of the things I've been wondering about as well as like, what does maintenance look like in the home where there's like an embedded smart home? And so person I know that's like a professor um, that's done a lot of interesting work in like animism and animistic design. And like, I guess you could like kind of link that to the idea of like, um, like uh, I'm blanking on the other term right now. Uh, Oh gosh. It's, it's definitely had a long day, but uh, yeah, like. uh, um, Okay. Is it religious animism or you mean like animation? Yeah, so I actually mean it in the sense of like Shinto animism. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um, and then the and idea the, of like the, neg- think... the negative term that people often use is pagan, but animism is usually more accurate. Exactly. exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And so there's lots of people that have believed that there are kind of spirits inside of something, right? And it's a way for I, the way I've interpreted it at least is it's a way for me to interpret the world that allows me to do it in a way that is like social. So so the idea of like the trickster fox, right? means like, I probably shouldn't trust foxes, (laughs) right? In some way. (laughs) And you probably shouldn't, like you shouldn't leave food out for foxes to get, like there's all these things that you should do that it helps maybe understand things a little bit more, right? And Mm -hmm. so I'm not necessarily talking about it in like a pure, like, um, like, like, yeah, pure religious way, but I've done a lot of work where we do role play. um, And actually I'm going to South by Southwest this weekend to do a workshop um, that's titled, you know, how does the Roomba really feel about dog shit? (laughs) <laughs> and basically, we're using uh, we're, we're using like I'm building character sheets where everybody gets a character sheet for a device inside the home, and then they have to come up with like what are their personality traits, right? What would it what would a Roomba's personality traits be, right? Like, and 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 again, I I have a bunch of ideas what that could be. You probably have a bunch of ideas what that could be, but it's like interesting to think about like what do we perceive their personality traits are because we we do a lot of anthropomorphization on devices all the time, right? Yes. And we do it because, again, we're trying to understand things. We're trying to build mental models. This is where, like, the term theory of mind comes in, where, you know, the idea that we build an understanding of what we think other people think. And there's some thinking that this is related to, like, the Dunbar number, right? So Mm -hmm. our brains are bigger and can hold more people's brains inside of our brain (laughs) for us to be able to now understand how they all interact. And so, I mean, this is something that a lot of AI and machine learning researchers are also going after is how do we actually have machines do a better job of building theory of mind of human beings? Um, but anyways, getting back to my main point about this like idea of animism and using that as like a way to do a, a better job of understanding how we should build devices. And so if people assume the Roomba to be like fastidious and like um, shy, like it doesn't want to be around people and a couple of the things that like you could associate with a person but if you kind of build it that way, like how would it act, right? Like what would be the error modes? What would it find? What would make it happy? What would make it disgusted? What would make it sad, right? What would scare it, 
And these are all things that end up being like events that we actually, it, it gets back to this whole world of like user research and design thinking, which is how do we end up like actually by anthropomorphizing these devices, we're actually talking about our expectations for the device. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, like I don't, I'm not an advocate of like personifying these things, but we do it a little bit already. And we are just trying to understand like, what is the right thing that this should do in this case so that it doesn't like violate the expectations that I have for it. Um, and so I, I don't know that, I think that's, that's where, oh, panpsychism, that's what I was thinking of as far as like a philosophical stance of like everything has consciousness, except like electrons, they have a consciousness. It's just like a predictable consciousness, <laughs> right? In comparison to like human beings and there's like dualism and all these other materialism, that type of stuff, right? Um, but I, I think it's like, anyways, I've used this as a model for me to be, help better understand what humans' expectations are for technology. Um, and I think that's like a really interesting thing to think about. And, and anyways, so getting back to my main point about like, what does it mean long-term for maintenance of the, 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 the smart home is like, when all these things are like built into the walls, right? Like I live in a house that's over a hundred years old. Wow. I can't even find like the line from the doorbell to the doorbell box is like, somewhere like i see it at one point and then it just goes into a wall and then it never comes out somewhere again and it's just like it's it's like a half volt so it's still connected somehow <laughs> but like but like that's a good question is now like no one planned for maintenance of that mm -hmm. right and when we start to actually build these things a lot of the time they're just plugged in and they're like sitting on a, a kitchen top right but what if we start building things more into our homes that is actually technological Right. Like my my dad used to build houses back in like the 80s. And in the 80s, like the thing you would do is you would put, you know, like Ethernet jacks in every room because that was the future of computing. Mm -hmm. And then you would have like, you know, this was like a high end. These were high end places. So it would have like a Bang & Olufsen like stereo controller in the wall <laughs> in every room that you wanted to have like stereo control, which like volume up and down and like track skip and that type of stuff. And but that that's just like crazy now. Right. And yeah. so. There's all these things that we just need to think about when it comes to the future of this stuff. And I don't know, we're just not doing a good job of, of thinking that way right now, I think. And, and so that's part of this project and this grant is to, to try to understand like, how does Urbit fit into that world? How does it fit into the home? And then how does identity change and kind of morph as time goes on based on that? Um, and so it, it's a very interesting project for me, definitely. And I look forward to all of the results as they come out. Is this going to be a, a very, like, is there a public place where my audience and your audience will be able to access and, and view all of this? Yeah, so I actually, I'm not sure. I do know that, so the, the end goal of this is to turn it into a white paper that's going to be oh, published. Nice. And then um, we're going to do like blog, you know, uh, boomer web posts and, um, you know, podcasts and whatever else we can think of for that. The next milestone for me is actually this Friday where I'm going to give them the uh, initial report uh, on synthesis of research findings. I don't think that's going to be published just as is. Um, but then the next step is to do a bunch of workshopping with kind of Urbit members. And so if there are any Urbit community members that are out there, they want to join the communal computing for Urbit community. Um, that's where I'm going to be announcing these workshops. And so they will be like an hour at a time. Not all of them will be role play. Don't worry. We won't do like nonstop role play. But some of them will be like, you know, like the life cycle of an IoT device in through the lens of Urbit. Right, the, the the life cycle of an identity um, through the lens of Urbit, like in the home, right, and um, scenario kind of exploration of like what are all the things that could go wrong in the home and how would Urbit deal with that, right? And so that that's the the second phase, and then the third phase is just like writing this huge report, white paper that I think is then going to be published publicly. Yeah, I I don't know about people. People have different levels of uh, allergy to uh, reading, but uh, I am a reader. I will read your your white paper. So I definitely look forward to that. I'm in a more general urban sense. Right now, it has kind of basic functions. It's not developed into yeah. this huge IoT world that we're talking about. What practical apps do you have and and use now? Like on urban. I mean, it's mostly the community, right? For me, it's really about connecting with the other people that are in the the like the community, and and that's been most valuable for me. Um, I'm one of the people that's like pretty bare bones with like a lot of the stuff. I actually like I, I would always prefer just to like to interact with people <laughs> than nice. than do other things. I think the thing that will be interesting longer term is like the tools I use right now to do my job like long form writing, I don't really do in Urbit yet. Mm -hmm. right? um, and yeah. then 
re reposted any of your blog posts to Urbit yet? I did a little bit. So if you go into the the communal computing for Urbit, there are like links there in the in like some of the the reference forums around that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like some of the more specific writing I need to do is like like introductions to this type of stuff inside the Urbit world. Um, but I think it's also like I want to use Urbit as an example of where we're we're actually thinking about things from the ground up in a way that makes more sense. And so I want to also show that to people outside. So I'm always going to be someone that's going to be like double posting, I think, everything that I do. Um, I do. I am really excited about like some of the small computer stuff that's going on. Like, how do you get stuff to work on a Raspberry Pi or other types of devices? Can you, can you say a little more about that? Because I know what a Raspberry Pi is. I'm definitely yeah. not the one who's going to set that up, but I find sure. the idea fascinating. Yeah, it's just like, I mean, so I think that like the there's always been this idea of like, how do you make really cheap, small computers that you can put anywhere, right? And that's been that's been a desire by people. And so people that were like in home automation originally had to like wire up capacitors and transistors and like little weird microchips into these like huge boxes just to control their home, right? But now what you have is like, and this probably started actually with Arduino, which is like a chip on a board that has a couple like out that you can control through a very simple, like a fairly simple programming language, right? Raspberry Pi is like a real computer, it's just super small. <laughs> and so it still has all these like pin outs that you can then start to control actuators, other type of stuff, like you could build a light bulb, like a, a Hue light bulb out of one of these things. Actually, a Raspberry Pi would probably be overpowered for a Hue light bulb, but you can imagine <laughs> like, it's basically a very small computer that has lower power requirements and can be put anywhere, right? And so people that are even in the like, industrial IoT world, right? Like they would actually just use Raspberry Pis, put a couple sensors that are soldered onto it with a magnet and put it on like the side of a machine to like measure something. And so it's like this, it's very DIY, but it's like, it's yeah. actually very easy DIY in comparison to what DIY used to be. So do they identify it as, because we've talked about identity oh. so much, this is funny, a desktop or a laptop? Because it's it sounds like a desktop because it's so tiny, but then it's so movable. I see that this is the thing where maybe like the terminology is no longer meaningful, right? Yeah. Like, like, like to your point, it's like, it's not meant to just go one place. Like I have, I, I have it downstairs in the basement, but I have like a box like this big of just like raspberry pies, Arduinos of like lots of different variations of this. So I have like one that's like called a yellow jacket, which is from a while ago, which has like a Wi-Fi chip on it because they don't usually have networking and it's super small. And actually I was using it to put it on top of a drone where I was building like this. Wow graffiti drone that you could like load up XML files of like graffiti and then would go and spray paint it on the side of a wall, basically. <laughs> um, and so it's like crazy stuff like that that you can start to piece together with these technologies. So I would just say it's like, it's computing, right? And and when I think about like Urbit long-term, I don't think of Urbit as like the desktop machine maybe. Maybe there are instances that are like, you have a server room in your home that's controlling your home. But the reality is like Urbit should probably eventually be on like every one of these devices in your home. It may not be in the near term, Right. Because if you like, there are some people that are trying to run like, um, you know, stars off of like Raspberry Pi and they're yeah. very. <laughs> so yeah. like, um, yeah, that's, that's the problem right now is that there's still going to be this like compute needs to catch up or Urbit needs to simplify. And this is why you see a lot of things like even in the world of like, like machine learning, there's big models in machine learning that are doing prediction or inference. Right. And then there's like this other version, which is called like tiny ML <laughs> and it's meant to run on these types of devices. So I think there always is like segmentation of like what compute power you have, but a lot of the world of IOT is trying to push this idea of like prediction or inference from a machine learning standpoint to the edge, because yeah. that's, that's where like, you don't want to actually be streaming every piece of data from this device. Because once you do that, like if everything in your home has one of these, you end up, being like hitting these network bottlenecks essentially and it's wasteful right so so it's more about like how are you doing detection at the edge what's referred to as the edge on the device itself and so that's that's where i think urbit still has like a little ways to go to be more adapted to that type of footprint um but i think that's like really interesting to me is it's a start of that type of thing and and i've talked to a couple of people where they believe like they actually need to get to the point where there's like a specific chip that's actually built for something like a raspberry pi um, that would be adapted for Urbit for it to really work. Um, and there's some other things about like address space and things like that, not to be too technical, but like, and again, I'm not the right person to talk about these technical things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think like longer term, there will be a drive for people to want to own their home in its entirety and they won't want their devices to be dependent on third parties as much. They will want it for special needs, right? Like, like if I, 
want a, like a security service that's monitoring my home, right? Like I will pay for that service. Yeah. But otherwise, like there's probably a lot of other things that maybe don't need to have as much connectivity potentially. So I think that's like, that's a question, right? Is, is what, what makes sense here? And I think it's, it's something where the more we can give people option to make that decision, I think is better um, because then it also allows them to make better decisions for themselves. Now, the issue is, is like, pe do people understand privacy implications? And I would argue they don't, right? They don't, they don't have models or frameworks to really understand those things. So it's up to us as developers of these things to do a better job of providing those types of frameworks or analogies or whatever, right? Um, and so that's something else that I'm hoping be, to kind of do with this grant is like, what would be a good analogy for people to understand? Um, so yeah. Well, it's great. And I think a lot of this is going to help people think through so that they can make their own decisions on the matter. Um, I think a lot of people are still new to it. And the general thing we're seeking is just greater and greater adoption. Do you have anything that we missed that you'd like to say? And uh, any any words of advice that could get people to just adopt to more quickly? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like for for all the people that are doing Urbit, right? Like it's, there's there's going to be there's going to be more and more interest in this. I think like I, I have a feeling like, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fortune teller and I, I don't know the future, but like, I do feel like there are lots of experiments we still need to run with computing platforms. And I think Urbit is a good next one. Right. Um, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of like dead systems that are out there. There's a lot of dead OSs that are out there that never moved on. But I think like, you know, for people that like to think about these types of things that like to think, from the standpoint of like, how do we remove some of the old assumptions that we had? I think Urbit is a really interesting place to do that. And that's why I've been so drawn to it and have gone through this like grant process to do the research. And I think the other thing I would just tell, I would say to people is like, you know, there's, there's definitely, I think this is the hard part is that companies are trying to do the right thing. I think like a lot of people that are individuals are trying to do the right thing individually. Um, but we end up getting into this realm that we're building things that are not necessarily good for the individual anymore. And I think that's, that's, that's a problem in product management that I think we're constantly struggling with, which is this constant drive to generalize. Because if we generalize, it means that we get access to a larger market. That means we can sell more devices, right? And so I think the opposite that I try to start with is this idea of like focusing in on an individual and trying to understand how we solve that person's problem. And then trying to see patterns in the way that we do that for individuals rather than the other way around, which is like going from a default over generalization. I think Urbit does this a lot with the way it handles communities today. There's no one community. Like I actually, there's a few main communities that you just get like added to, but like a majority of it is like way off <laughs> and like not, not visible because it's more about like meeting people and, and that type of thing. And so again, I haven't explored that much in, inside of that because I, I honestly have a lot of social stuff I need to deal with anyways in real life. Um, but I, I found like the personal people that I've started to like interact with around communal computing have been really thoughtful and have like lots of interesting opinions about this stuff. So um, I think that's the thing that's really cool is like, there's a lot of people that are really thinking deeply about these problems that are working on Urban and they're trying to rethink a lot of these paradigms that we've used previously. And I think that's great. Excellent. And um, where can people find either your writings or if they want to follow you? And yeah, a more I would say like Twitter. Platform. Twitter's my main one. So like Chrisbot is my uh, my Twitter handle and I'll, I'll send that to you. But um, that's where I tend to post everything that I write or, um, you know, like videos, things like that um, is, is probably the best way to follow me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you.